Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. While you're still standing, if you have your Bible and would like to turn to Psalms 42. Psalms 42, verses 1 and 2. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And now, Psalm 63, 1 and 2. O God, thou will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. And Psalms 84 verse 2 my soul longeth yea even fainteth for the courts of the Lord my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God I had a fearful experience last Thursday morning at 2.30 in the morning a fearful meeting with the Lord concerning this service tonight. He told me we had a deficiency. You know what a deficiency is? It's something that is lacking, that you need. When he said deficiency, I thought of One of our missionary kids a few years ago in Madagascar, Randy Richardson, said to his mother, Mother, I feel like I'm falling out of the chair. And she said, Oh, Randy, don't be silly. And about that time, he hit the floor. And she turned to see his body is twisted, his arms and his legs. They rushed him to the hospital. And the doctor said, Mrs. Richardson, did no one ever tell you that the water in this country has no calcium in it? And this young man is suffering from an acute calcium deficiency. And it surprised me when the Lord said, we have a deficiency. He said, there's not enough hunger for me. There's not enough thirsting after me. Could it be that we fill our lives with such unimportant things that we don't have time to be hungry and thirsty for God? I remember another incident from Africa. A missionary from, is actually from Canada, believed our same message, lived in a neighboring country, came and preached for us several times in South Africa, and had a great revival there. In fact, I think that was the first revival I was ever in that I saw 120 get the Holy Ghost. And so one of those men that got the Holy Ghost loved him very much and said, now I'm coming to get you when you're back again. Knew he was coming. He said, and we're going to fix you a big turkey dinner. Well, that wasn't something we had often on the mission field. So uh, this was sounded real good. But by the time two or three months elapsed, uh, that date, he forgot, and we forgot. And as we left for service that morning, I laid out for our servant everything. She was a good cook and usually did this for us. And, uh, but when we got back, tired and weary from a service, expecting a good meal, oh, Elizabeth's grandmother died. I don't remember how many grandmothers that was, but... Anyway, Elizabeth's grandmother died, and there was the raw meat and the raw potatoes and nothing. Well, they didn't have many restaurants, and uh, then that changed later, but uh, uh, we couldn't afford to go to the ones that were there. And, but they had what they call little cafes, and these little cafes would sell bread and bologna and cheese and a few little essentials. So my husband hurried down, there was one close, and he came back. They were out of cheese, but he got bologna and bread. So we sat down and we 
uh, well, they had awful good bologna over there, you know, I mean, considering. And we made a meal on bologna and bread. And just as we finished, the brother come to take Brother Curry for the turkey dinner. I anxiously awaited his return. Brother Curry, how did it go? He said, most beautiful turkey I ever saw. Dressing was good too. I, I took a plate of it and I pushed it around on my plate, but I was so full of bologna I didn't have room for turkey. <laughs> I'm afraid we're full of so many things that we don't have room for the rich blessings of God and what he would like to do for us. If some way, somehow, in these services, God could help us to understand that our greatest basic need, this is what God said, is to hunger and thirst after him. Have you ever been thirsty, so thirsty that it seemed you could hardly stand it? I remember 1965, we had not been in America for seven years on our way home for furlough. Found out we could go by way of Israel at no extra expense except our hotel there. And our believers in South Africa gave us money, said, now go and spend a few days there. And that was a joy, and we did enjoy it. Uh, but one day we went down to the Dead Sea. It was so hot. Oh, it was hot, and it was dry. And that was before I learned to always carry a bottle of water with me. And... Uh, we couldn't hardly wait to get in the hotel where the meal was planned. Set a bottle of wine on the table. My husband said, we do not drink wine. Could you please bring us some water? He was gone a long time. They brought this food and it looked good, but we were so thirsty we could hardly eat the food. And the man come back, he said, drink the wine. It's cheaper than water. And well, we didn't drink the wine and we did eat just a little bit, but not very much. And so the bus is to take us back and we start on our way back to Jerusalem or wherever we were going from there. And the bus threw a rod climbing out of this, you know, the Dead Sea is the lowest spot on the world and it's down below sea level and climbing up out of that dry, hot valley, the bus threw a rod and there we were. And I want you to know in that desert, the Negev Desert, we, were, we thought we were dry before. We found out what dry was. Our tongues actually swelled in our mouth. Finally, a workman's bus come along and they crammed us all in there. And I said something to my husband, oh, if I just had a drink of water. Just, I, I can sympathize with that rich man in hell wanting three drops for his tongue if I just had a few drops of water. And so someone heard me. They said, well, there is a, they have a water jug up at the front. Well, I made my way through somehow to get up there. If there's some water, I had to have it. I felt like I couldn't go much further. But the water was full of worms. And so I went back, swollen tongue, parched mouth, to my little place, little niche. I'll never forget when we got to Beersheba and that old Arab selling ice cream on a stick was so dirty, but the ice cream was well wrapped and to get something to moisten our tongues. When you really get thirsty, you can't think of anything else. You, your mind is obsessed by your need, your need, oh God. If we could really get hungry and thirsty for him, what a difference it would be. Oh God. You see, when people are so hungry and thirsty for God, they don't take time to stop and measure. This is a silly little habit we've got. It is so foolish and it's so displeasing to God, but we're always going around measuring people and uh, measuring preachers and uh, I, I endorse heartily everything that has been said already here tonight because in God's book, listen, the blood of Jesus makes of all of one size. There's no big eye nor little you. There's no important people and unimportant people. Every last one of us are special to him. And let's quit this business of measuring. And there wouldn't be any pecking on each other and finding fault with each other if we were so hungry 
and thirsty for God. Oh God, help us tonight. My soul thirsted and hungers and longs. I long for God to take complete control of his church and do what he planned to do all along. Do what he wants to do. He wants to do something. But our tastes are going to have to be altered. A year ago Thanksgiving, we haven't had many opportunities like this to have family with us in Thanksgiving. But we had two teenage grandsons. And I wish you could have seen the pained look on their face when we sat down to that roast turkey dressing. Uh, my daughter came from Arkansas and cooked the meal, and she's a fantastic cook. And I did a few little things. And Matt, uh, you know, the candied yams, you name it. The table was groaning with the weight. And these two poor little darlings sit there with this pained look on their face. And their mother's trying to say, now, come on, boys. Don't act like that. Don't make grandma and grandpa feel bad. Eat. And they take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And finally, Thanksgiving night, they said, Grandpa, could you take us to Burger King where we can get some real food? <laughs> you see, uh, I think we have a generation hooked on preservatives. Nothing else tastes good to them. And there's too many of God's people that are hooked on things that are not important. Our tastes have got to change. We have got to come to the place that we're hungry for Jesus more than anything in this world. I thank God I do see a beginning of a hunger and a thirsting for the reality of God's presence and not the trappings. We've had a lot of trappings. We've had a lot of background. We've had a lot of other things. But oh, my soul tonight longs and thirsts and hungers to see God do what he wants to do. Let me tell you, I've got to share with you what he told me in those early hours morning. He said, every service, there are so many things I want to do. But the people are not hungry enough. They're not thirsty enough. And I am not able to reach down to them. I cannot get past their attitudes. We've had our taste whetted for great dramatics in oratory and I thank God for the talent among us God has blessed us with exceeding a talent and I appreciate that and there's nothing wrong with it but there needs to be in the hearts of those who hear a deep hunger and a deep thirst for God to do what he wants to do I will never forget a meeting in Texas one time preachers wives we come down to the last service and I'm bringing what God had given me and I could see a lot of them had left already their bodies were still there but they'd already left and the Lord stood by me and he said I was here to answer every need and to solve every problem and fulfill every dream and move every obstacle and heal every sickness I was here to do everything they needed but they did not have a desire enough for me they did not reach out for me they did not reach to take what they needed <laughs> I feel that way tonight and it's been said two or three times. Why is it that we just keep our little problems and hold on to them and we don't want to turn loose? And he is here. If we only had enough hunger and thirst for him. There was a man years ago 
that fell on his knees and said, God, give me Scotland or I die. And that man out of his deep hunger, without knowing what you and I know, <laughs> oh God, if, is, is God's revelation to us giving us a place to sort of go to sleep on? and just be self-satisfied and think we have got it made because we know who he is and we know his name that should never be because you know more truth that's more responsibility that's a greater burden on us to reach out with what God has given us <laughs> God stir up your people make them hungry I get asked so often why, why don't we see more miracles in America? They have so many miracles overseas. Well, I want you to know there's a lot of miracles do happen in America. There's an awful lot of them. But nothing like what God would like to do. You see, we're not hungry enough yet. We're not thirsty enough. I see indications that there are those reaching out. Oh, God, don't let it be too late. Help us to reach out so you can do what you want to do in this very meeting. If there was more hunger in our heart for him, his demonstration, and what he can do and what he will do, and if there was more thirsting of our souls for him, reaching out to him out of our desperate thirst and hunger, there is no telling what God would still do tonight. It is not what I can say. It's not what anybody can say. It's what he can do. If only we were more hungry and thirsty for him. Didn't he say in Matthew chapter 5, I think I could quote it, but I'll turn over here and read it because I want to be sure I get it exactly right. Matthew 5 and 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled if you ever go to a service and say, well, I just didn't get as much out of this tonight as I thought I would, go home and look in the mirror, honey, and find out who's to blame. God will meet your hunger. God will meet your thirst. And this whole service has been geared this whole service has been geared to bring you to a place that your heart and your soul and your very being, your soul and your flesh would reach out to him with great longing, with deep hunger, and with a desperate thirst. And then he would be able to do what he wants to do. Oh, don't think that I can stand here and wave my little hand and something happen. There's nothing to this hand. There's nothing to me. But we've got a God. <laughs> I read it just before I came in here. All things are possible with him. All things are possible. We're just not hungry enough. We're satisfied to live on meager fare spiritually. He told me. He said, every service, I am there. You never gather together that he is not there. He said, I do not move. I cannot move. In my own hometown, I didn't do many miracles. Because they said, who is this man? Isn't he the son of Joseph? Who does he think he is? And because of their unbelief. And you see, unless you have that thirst and hunger and longing for him, there's other things that's living in your heart. And that's why he cannot do what he wants to do. <sighs> I have never in my life, God sparing me to May, it will be 53 years that I have been preaching the gospel, and I have never in all of my life been as hungry for him as I am tonight. I have never in all of my life been as thirsty as I am for him tonight. I have never longed for him. David said one time, my soul breaketh for its longing unto God. And his word. 
<laughs> We're having to force ourselves to do so much. You see, that would not even be there. You wouldn't have to force yourself to pray. I want to tell you a little behind the scenes story. See, I don't preach by notes. I woke up here saying, God, I'm as empty as an old shoe thrown away out in the wind and the rain and the dirt that has no ability or power. But whatever you tell me to say, I will say. And I must tell you this. We have every year uh, what's something they call the school of missions. All of the missionaries go missionary kids that possibly can get there after a certain age are there. And the man who was in charge come to me and said, Sister Freeman, I need some help. I've got a bunch of missionary kids here. They're sweet kids, and they really love God. But there's some rebelliousness in them that I don't know how to handle. And he said, please pray, and then come and talk to them. I got there, and I began to talk to these kids. What is the problem? They said, we hate the way they worship in America. I said, it, it's awful. I said, they got to get up there and say, stand up, turn around, say this, say that, do this, do that. And it, it's, it's like they're the PE director at, at school, making them go through exercises. Praise the Lord. Everybody say hallelujah. Uh, shake hands. Uh, say this. Say that. They say, we hate it. <laughs> Said in, in our country, and they represented many different countries. Said in our country, the people are so hungry for God that they're just worshiping and praising and magnifying God and the waves of the glory of God sweep across the surfaces and there's nobody pulling a string or pushing a button and we can't stand this forced and demanded worship. They said here in America, you got worship on demand. I said, I understand exactly how you feel. I feel the same way every time I come back to the States from Africa. I said, well, what you don't understand is that these Americans are so hidebound that if somebody didn't tell them to say praise the Lord, they'd never say it. If somebody didn't say raise your hands, they wouldn't do it. They won't take their liberty and go ahead and worship God. You see, you're just not hungry enough to do that yet. I am praying and seeking God that it will happen, that people will begin to forget about looking at who's who and what's what and begin to worship God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I went on to the young people though, I said, now listen, I feel just like you do, and I don't really want to do it, because that's not the way I like it the best. I said, but that man of God that's up there, that's in charge, is trying to correct a situation that needs correcting, and if you don't do it, you're rebellious, and you don't want to be rebellious, do you? So they all said no, and there was a change in them. I said, it's, it's what we can call it culture, I guess. I said, it's the American culture to resist the Spirit of God, evidently. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You see, we've got little ideas about how a service should be handled. And, uh, you know, there's some folks that don't think anything can, can happen unless they get up to the front. Well, you see, uh, where, we, where we had a lot of services in Africa, there was no way that anybody could get to the front. So God filled the Holy Ghost on the back row and healed people all over the congregation. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Do you know what I'm so hungry for? I am so hungry to see in America, and God called us back from Africa for that reason. We didn't come back because we were too old. I'll be 76 in July. I'm working just as hard, in fact, a little bit harder than I did in Africa. I at least got to stay four or five days someplace, each place I went. I don't get to do that anymore. And I won't bore you with telling you where all I've been. It's not important. But you see, God told me I'm sending you back to America with some special meetings. 
some special messages. And I didn't feel like I was qualified and I didn't want to do it. And I tried to talk him out of it. I said, now look, God, you called us to Africa. And we came. We left our family. We came and we, and we love it. We came in your will. He said, yes, you came in my will. But my will's not set in concrete. And my will is for you to go back to America. So I am here my God's appointment. <laughs> you see, this is the way God wants to work. We, we try to program and arrange everything. You see, he wants to take over. Now, look, I, don't misunderstand me. Don't read into what I say, something I haven't said. <laughs> I, I, am, I appreciate our leaders, our pastors, and our superintendents. And I endorse every word that has been said here so far tonight. But what I am saying is God wants us to get these silly ideas out of our heads. Hey, this is what happened in Africa. While the word is going out, they begin to get the Holy Ghost all over the place. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I want to see God do. Who cut out of the heart, out of the Some of us remind me of the little girl that had a sore throat and she come up to be prayed for. And the pastor prayed for quite a few. And uh, her mother took her by the hand, leading her away and said, now honey, is your sore throat gone? She said, no, he didn't shake me enough when he prayed for me. <laughs> See, she, was, uh, she had her confidence in the shaking. We, we feel like somebody's gotta put their hands on us and, go through a, some kind of performance for us to get healed and it's the name that does it and it's the faith that does it and it's nothing that a preacher can do or anybody else can do <laughs> oh god make us hungry <laughs> make us hungry <laughs> make us hungry <laughs> if we ever get hungry enough and thirsty enough there is some tremendous things that are going to happen. I never thought about making a career of ladies' meetings. I saw the need, 1971, when I came back after being gone from America for six years. I saw the spiritual poverty of our women. I'd stand around and, and, uh, and I don't eavesdrop, but just, you know, couldn't help but hear them uh, as they're talking and, and they're talking about decor and they're talking about what color are you? And well, let me show you this neat way I've learned to fix my hair. And they're talking about everything else but the word. Oh, God. I remember how I would get on my knees in 1971. I'd get on my knees and I'd read the scripture to the Lord in Malachi chapter 3 verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another and the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name and they shall be mine saith the Lord of hosts in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. <laughs> if you want to be written up in God's book, <laughs> you better begin to think on him and talk about him. <sighs> oh God, let us begin to call one another and say, oh, I just read this wonderful scripture this morning. Let me share with you what I have found in the word of God. Let speak on his name let's talk about him let's talk about his word let's talk about who he is and what he can do and what he wants to do for us <laughs> oh i am stirred to the depths of my soul <laughs> Please.
That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, where is the hunger and the thirst for God? When shall I see God? When shall I see the living God? When shall I see his power? When shall I see his glory? <laughs> when shall I see him do what he wants to do? Oh, God. <laughs> Ooh, tarabahu shatarabaha satayah. Oh, God. Oh, God. We're so sentimental. There's going to be some of you that's going to say, well, you know, this is not, we don't have all the trees and everything like we had it. Hey, the situation or the place doesn't make any difference at all. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're hungry for God, and if your soul is reaching out for him with a thirst, don't ever think that he doesn't see and he doesn't know and that he doesn't care because he sees and he knows and he cares. And if you will only begin to let your soul, and I believe that he is trying, I believe he is trying to quicken us, but we get distracted very easily. Very easily. Oh, God. Put us on target tonight. I'm tired of seeing us wander down our little rabbit trails busying our minds with things that are not important the only thing that's important tonight is for us to understand God is looking through this beautiful crowd of ladies you all look good to me you look lovely I had six brothers and never had a sister and do I ever enjoy my sisters in the Lord they, each one are so special to me. Even those I don't know their name and never seen them before, you're still special to me because I feel like God gave each one of you to me for a sister and that's, that's nice when you never had one and always wanted one and I was the first child and I hoped every one of those brothers but the first one, five brothers, I thought I just was wishing every one of them would be a little girl. I want a sister so bad. But you see, my sisters, I want you to understand something tonight. <laughs> You are living beneath your privileges in God. While you are pursuing things that have no value in the spiritual realm, you are missing the best part. And I have such a deep feeling that this is not just another retreat. This is not just another meeting. The very fact that you are here shows that you do have some hunger. And there is some longing in your soul. But may God deepen this. Oh, listen. If I can hear someone say tomorrow, I was so moved with a thirst for God, a hunger for more of Him, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> fellowship is good but there's something that's more important I watch our patterns and I remember in these little patterns you know we with our attitudes and our impatience for that service to get to an end we bind the preacher and bind the spirit of God and then we sit around and chatter and gab longer than the service went on. And then we go out to eat and chatter and gab some more. And we don't even realize. We was in a hurry. And I hear the complaints. Oh, we got a good pastor, but is he ever long-winded? Go with me to a service in Ethiopia. I mean, the people were, didn't have nice, comfortable seats like you've got. They were sitting on all kind of contraptions, and a lot of them had nothing but the ground to sit on. The church was so full that they had to break out the side of the wall and they put the pulpit over there, because outside there was six or 7,000 people, and they tried to put canvas over them, and there were gaps like this, and there were six of us to preach. 
and they said, we don't want any sermonettes. We are so hungry. Our souls are so parched and so dry. We are so thirsty. Give us water. Give us the living water. Give us the eternal bread. We are hungry. And when you got up there, they made you forget the time and everything else. They, they make you almost preach yourself to death because there's such a deep hunger and such an enormous thirst after God and the things of God. And I saw it rain. And here these sweet people are sitting under those big, big gaps. The rain is peppering down on them. And they just sit there and worship and listening. Just listening. They lean forward. Don't want to miss a word. They are so hungry that they don't care if they're getting wet. They don't care if they're being rained on. They don't care if they're uncomfortable. And their hunger and thirst for God exceeded everything else. Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> seven straight hours of preaching and the leader stands up and says only problem was this was just too short it was just too short if I got wound up and preached to you seven hours I wonder how many of you'd stay I wonder oh God we're trying to make it too cut and dried. Listen to me. We've got to forget this cut and dried stuff. <laughs> and sometimes God wants to move, but we hadn't hardly got time. As one preacher said, we got to beat the Baptist to the cafeteria on Sunday. You don't, you know. Uh, we said, when does the service close? He said, oh, you can stop whenever you like. We all leave at quarter to 12. Got to beat the Baptist to the cafeteria. I wonder how God feels when we try to make our little worship. Come on, God. Now, bless us now, but be sure you get through by 11.30. Come on, God. Now, bless us, but be sure it, you end it by 9.30. I mean, that's more all we can say. We've got other things. We are trying to put God in a box, and you'll never succeed. Oh, God. I wish that somehow or another such an anointing would come on me that God would open your understanding to realize what a lack there is, what a desperate need there is for a hunger and a thirst for you. Oh, God, we need you, Jesus, we need you. The world is on the edge of something that is going to test the children of God. I'm not getting into any doctrinal area. That's not my specialty. But I am just telling you that no nation can murder millions of unborn and still continue to be prosperous and everything go well. And while it wasn't my desire or your desire, we are in a land where it has been legal A judge in New Jersey said it right. He said, abortion is legal murder. Legal murder. And I cannot forget that one woman got prayer out of our schools. One woman. Oh, my sister, you may never stand behind a pulpit. I didn't want to. This is not my choice. It's his. I'm here only because of his choice. But if you can tonight say, by God's grace, I will be so hungry and so thirsty for him that he will have to move in our church. It's not what you can say. It's not you can shake your finger in somebody's face and tell them to stop being so cold and backslid. That's not what's needed. Just allow him to make you so hungry and thirsty. <laughs> David said, more than my daily bread, <laughs> I was hungry for him. <laughs> I hungered for him. I was thirsty for him. <laughs> oh, can you not understand that our lack of days ago, status quo, 
complacency will never bring revival. <laughs> and sometimes we get into the frantic praying, you know, oh God, oh, we're going to make God do something. Let me tell you something, a consistent hunger and thirst after God is what we need. We don't need these spasmodic eight-day wonders. We need people that 24 hours out of every day we're crying out, Oh God, I'm so hungry for you. I'm so hungry for what you want to do. I am so thirsty to see your power and your glory. God wants to show us his glory. Yes, he does. But he's not going to do it. He will not do it. Until we long for it. Mrs. Freeman, I'm a little bit scared. I, I don't know if I, 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 I want to see the glory of God. My friend, if you ever get a glimpse of his glory, it will change you so utterly and so completely. Then you'll be giving him that spontaneous worship. Not just in a service. Oh, but when you're at home, in your home, or driving in a car down the road. I was worshiping the Lord driving down a car, driving in a car down the road one day, and the cop pulled me over. And now, and of course, you don't lose track of what the, where the speedometer is and, uh, and stop signs and all of that stuff, but it wasn't a stop sign, it was a yield right away. And he pulled me over and he said, uh, where have you been? <laughs> so then I knew what he thought, so I took off my sunglasses and I got out of the car. I said, I have been to a Pentecostal prayer meeting. Do you know anything about the Pentecostal power of God? Do you know anything about what God did on the day of Pentecost and what he wants to do for people today? Do you know anything about getting the Holy Ghost and talking in other tongues? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. He said, oh, 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 you mean some religious thing? Oh, well, that's all right. I, I'm sorry. And I said, wait a minute. I, I want to tell you some more. And he's going to his car, and he's trying to get away, and I'm following up right behind him. I said, hey, let me just tell you, God wants to do something for everybody in this world. He wants to give them something that will change their lives and make them different people. Hallelujah. Woo. <laughs> Hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. <laughs> God, I'm so hungry. God, I'm so hungry for you. I'm hungry for you, Jesus. I'm thirsty for you, Jesus. I want you, Jesus, more than anything else. I don't need anything else in this world like I need you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. Let me read the words of David again. <laughs> As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? <laughs> o God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as I've seen thee in thy sanctuary, O my God. <laughs> Oh, my soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. <laughs> my heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. <laughs> if we begin to cry out for him, <laughs> I feel like he is doing something right now. There's some attitude transplants going on. God is trans transplanting your 
worldly, fleshly, carnal attitudes into a longing for him, a thirst for him, a hunger for him. My heart is hungry. My soul is hungry. My flesh is hungry. I thirst for thee, O living God. <laughs> God, living God, living God. <laughs> oh, God. Shake us out of our complacency, God. Shake us out of our... beautifully sung tonight. He's all we need. <laughs> Jesus is all we need. <laughs> if you lose everything else that you've got and you've still got Jesus, you're wealthy, you're rich, you're blessed. <laughs> I got a testimony that thrilled me. A man and his wife drove home from a trip to see their home burning down and it was too far gone for any fire wagon to help. And he reached over and put his arm around his wife and he said, darling, let's praise God and rejoice as we see our home going to ashes. He said, I know there's some little pictures and little things in there that mean a lot to you, but it isn't important. We've still got Jesus, and he's the very best thing anyone can have and the only thing important for anyone to have. And they rejoiced as their home finished burning down, realizing he is the most important thing in this world. And if he is not of prime importance to you, you don't know what you're missing. You see, when we're so full of a thirst and a longing and a hunger for him, we won't have time to dislike anybody or disagree with somebody, find fault with somebody. There's no place for that when you're reaching for him with every atom, with every atom. David talked in his worship of his bones, crying out to the living God. My bones cry out for you, the living God. He said, I read the other day that in my body there are 60 billion cells. And every one of them have the equivalent of a 500 volume library in it. Every one of those 60 billion cells tonight are crying out, I'm hungry for you, Jesus. I'm hungry for what you can do. I'm hungry to see what you want to do. I'm longing for you, oh God, with every atom of my being, with every cell in my body. And for the rest of this journey that God gives me in this world, this is my testimony. I long for the living God to come and show his glory. Oh, my little child, do you not understand? You get what you want. Isn't that the way you live? When you decide you want something, you plan, you scheme, you save, you work toward it. If you only wanted me that bad, I would be there. I would show you my glory. 
I would show you my power. <gasps> what is your desire? What do you want? <laughs> oh God, oh Jesus, we want you, Lord. Sing it, Brother Goodine. <laughs> we want you, Jesus. We want you. <laughs> Everything, everything. <laughs> 